Welcome back again. And uh, we're getting to the nitty gritty here today, rather, with some of the the real political ins and outs and who was knifing who and why and what and oh, all of it starting around that Rudd concession, of course. And I thought it was just probably appropriate to say that in all the eight years that it took me to do the research for The Horns, which is the first book of the trilogy and which takes us from King of Zilikasi through to UDI, the Declaration of Independence by Ian Smith. So I had to balance in historical fiction the exactitude of the history, as far as I could establish it, which was not easy, with the fictional overlay that would bring it to life. So some of it is fact, some of it is fiction. Mainly the fact is the research. But the fiction in drawing out the characters of my three best friends when I was a child has really brought the rest of it to life by enhancing an aspect of that and telling the story as though it was part of their family. But there was another aspect that did become difficult, and that was in whether or not I should provide references and whether or not I should provide appendices. And eventually I decided... Yes, I would do minimal references, because it is not a PhD. It's not designed to be that. But for anybody who's ever lived in that land between two rivers, or anybody who, in future, in researching the subject, they would want a few appendices. So I've included things like the Rudd Concession, things like the Declaration of Independence, things like the hunt for Lobengula's grave. All sorts of bits and pieces like that are attached as appendices at the end of the book. So I thought I'd just mention that before we get cracking. Right, last week we mentioned the Rudd Concession and I ended the programme by saying there were two things that really caused an uproar. One was ten white men and the other was a particular clause in the concession. So let's read exactly what that particular clause was because... This was what really put everybody's back up. Bearing in mind, camped around for months and months have been hundreds of people trying to get a concession from Loban Gula, and he had actually got to the point of refusing to see anybody. In Thompson's account, we mentioned Thompson last week, when his tongue stuck out of his mouth when he was heading down in a panic to Bechuanaland. This was before that. In Thompson's account of the signing, he says, Mr. Helm, who had been concerned in watching the interests of the natives and ensuring that all we did was fair and above board, accompanied us. They found the king sitting on a brandy case in the corner of the Bokra. He was in a good mood, but appeared anxious, and for over half an hour he declined to sign the paper, saying he never signed his name. Then suddenly he said, Helm, let alaba. Helm, bring it here. And he signed it. Lobengula would not allow any of his indunas to sign, as he said they had already discussed it and they had already agreed on the concession. And of course, this is perfectly in line with the consensus that always happened among the chiefs and the headmen. Until they reached consensus, they would not move forward. And it had actually taken from the middle of September 1888 to the very end of October 1888 to get all those Ndunas together to reach that consensus. They had done so, therefore there was no need for them to sign. And what was the clause? Right. And whereas I have been much molested of late by diverse persons, legalese, all of it, for a Loban Gula wouldn't have understood this, I hardly can. L various diverse persons seeking and desiring to obtain grants and concessions of land and mining rights in my territories, I do hereby authorise the said grantees, Rudd, Maguire and Thompson, their heirs, re representatives and assigns, to take all necessary and lawful steps to exclude from my kingdoms principalities and dominions, all persons 
seeking land, metals, minerals, or mining rights therein. And I do hereby undertake to render them such needful assistance as they may from time to time require for the exclusion of such persons, and to grant no concessions of land or mining rights from and after this date without their consent and concurrence. Their consent and concurrence being the Rudd Concessionaires. This given under my hand this 30th day of October, 1888, and at my royal crawl. Now, can you imagine? All of a sudden, all those concessionaires were disenfranchised. They knew perfectly well that by appealing to the Rudd concessionaires and behind that Rhodes and presumably behind that the British South Africa Company, they had precious little chance of getting any real concessions. So they were furious. Absolutely furious. The most incredible campaign was set up with letters to the Cape Times, letters to the Johannesburg Star, all declaiming this as false and absolutely appalling. People going to Logan Gula, telling him he had sold his country and that he would be defrocked and dethroned and killed and everybody would march in and just steal everything. It wasn't good stuff. So, in the middle of it all, of course, the missionaries were called to account. Primarily among them, Charles Helm. Now, to recap a little bit on what happened last week, Charles Helm was very much respected by Loeb and Guru. They shared an enormous respect for each other. The families of Charles Helm always went to show the latest child to King Lobengula. King Lobengula spent a lot of his time with the Helms, talking and learning from them. So there was a great relationship. Now, there was a man called Tainton, I, who in one particular thing I heard read had, had smallpox and therefore couldn't do the translation. But in actuality, he accidentally killed one of the Matabilis. So he was not really persona grata in Loban Gula's eyes, although he had pardoned him. But all of a sudden, Rudd found, as he was getting to this, that he had no translator. So he asked Helm, who was fluent in Sindebele, if he would do so. Helm went straight to the chief to tell him and just said, look, I don't know to have anything to do with politics, but I will tell you what they are saying. OK, so when all of this blew up, and when that really pathetic concession with so little detail in it came up. Then the London Missionary Society asked a man called Elliot from Inyati if he would go and talk to the king and find out what had happened. Elliot's overall summary was, in the hands of honourable, upright men, all would be well. Mr Thompson had given verbal explanations through Mr Helm that met all the difficulties raised by the opposition. But in the hands of rascals, all would be bad for the Matibili. These explanations were unfortunately only verbal, and when we read the paper to the king, we could not say they were there. OK, we'll find out more about just what they were. Now, one of the people involved in all of it, of course, was Helm himself. So he, in his reports to the London Missionary Society, said the grantees, that was Rudd, Rhodes, all of that lot, explained to the chief that what was deemed necessary to get out the gold was to erect some dwellings for their overseers, to bring in and erect machinery, and to use wood and water. They promised that they would not bring in more than ten white men to work in his country that they would not dig anywhere near towns and that their people would abide by the laws of his country and in fact become as his people. But these promises were not put in the concession. Now, in the hands of a man with more on hands-on legal experience than Maguire, perhaps they should have been put in. 
or perhaps a great deal more should have been put in, instead of just the, I'll give you this and we'll pay you that, which was effectively all it was, except for that clause, which Loeb and Guller very much wanted, because he was sick and tired of all these concessionaires, and that was he would no longer have to deal with the concessionaires, that it was up to them in the Rudd concession. But Helm went on to say no power was given to the grantees except to get gold out of the land, and that necessarily the grantees in his country had to abide by the laws of his country. So on the face of it, a very different situation from what eventually happened. But no, as you can imagine, within seconds, in went all the disenfranchised ones, sitting, refusing to leave, one of whom was this man Tainton, who obviously was keen to get back in the king's good books. And he went to the king, you've sold your country, armed forces will come, they'll depose you, they'll put another chief in place. In the meantime, Rudd, of course, was on his way down to take the concession document to Sir Henry Locke, who was the governor of the Cape and also the High Commissioner for the whole of South Africa. Now, he was in Cape Town, so Rudd was out of the picture. Elliot then came in with pronunciation to say that not everything that was said was in the document, and then Helm, of course, mentions in his letter to the LMS about the ten men. The ten men were not mentioned anywhere else, but they became a real focal point, as you will see in just a moment. Now, enter the situation. Ah, a man called Lippert. Now, Lippert had been flaunting with Rhodes for many, many years. He was desperate to be as clever, as well-off, as everything as Rhodes. But he was of a different calibre. He was a German, Edmund Lippert, and it is quite fascinating what has been written about him. But this will give you a bit of an idea of his character. He gained a valuable but very dubious concession to import dynamite from Paul Kruger, president of the Transvaal. He went on to sell it to small miners and corporations alike at an exorbitant profit. Well, as you can imagine, there was an outcry. A conference was held to demand that the government revoke his monopoly immediately. But it was dramatically disrupted when one of the small miners arrested everyone's attention, saying he had heard the voice of God, who said, should Lippert's monopoly be revoked, disaster would befall the whole industry. His belief was so absolute that it changed the whole tenor of the conference. And Lippert kept his monopoly. Rather interesting, it was only weeks later when in some rather careless barroom talk, Lippert agreed that he had also actually heard the, the voice because he was in the next door bedroom. He then said, but I was a bit interested to note that God had a Cape Dutch accent. So that was the man. He was the one in the room. He was the one who purported to be God. And he terrified that poor little lone dynamite man. Not a character, not a nice character at all. In fact, you pick up a huge amount more from a very eminent historian of his time, Arthur Keppel Jones, and he describes it all, anything to do with Lippert, as a long and complicated story of intrigue, cross-examination, bribery, and judicial murder. Pretty strong words. He saw clearly from the Rudd concession that Rhodes could not show legal title to any land, and further, that in spite of all efforts, King Lobengula, already involved in a dispute with him arising from a previous concession, would refuse to give him an inch of ground. Here I intervened, he wrote later, and wow, did he not intervene. He had a man there who was doing the work for him. He wasn't actually in Matabili land himself. But this man was a man called Rene Tailleur. And he went in and got 
an audience with Lobin Gula in the middle of all the fandango about what was going on. And he said to him, King Lobin Gula, that last concession was nonsense. It didn't say the right things. I will take what you want and I will take this down to a leading lawyer in Johannesburg and get him to write exactly what you want. So first of all, he produced a blank piece of paper and on that he asked him to write his X and he produced the bull elephant seal to seal that. He signed it himself, as did a man called Fairbairn and a couple of others, Akert and another man who happened to be there as well. No missionaries present. Blank sheet of paper. He produced a second blank sheet of paper and he said, now you will tell us and we will make notes of just what you want and on this piece of paper we will write down exactly what you want. He got the king to sign two blank sheets of paper. I confess it's the one thing that makes me really angry when I read that. Really, really angry. In the book, I get the character of Jabu to read what he had actually put in from there. So let me just recap a little bit. So that went off to this man in Johannesburg. And with all the detail in it, which I'm just about to read to you, and the signatures at the bottom, it then went to Sir Henry Locke in Cape Town. Fortunately, Locke did, saw there was no missionary signature and sent it straight back up to John Moffat, who was the administrator in Matabili Land. Now, this is what they actually included on the second blank sheet of paper. It was Jabu's turn to read. The sole and exclusive right and privilege for the full term of 100 years to lay out, grant or lease for such periods as we may think fit, farms, townships, building plots, grazing areas, to impose and levy rents, licenses and taxes, to get in, collect and receive the same, to give and grant certificates in my name for the occupation of any farms, to establish and to grant licences for the establishment of banks, to issue banknotes, to establish a mint, etc, etc, etc. As Jabu's voice faded in disgust and despair, Angus concluded, and in return, the price ultimately settled was £1,000 down and £500 a year. Much later, Lippert wrote, After many efforts, my delegation succeeded in sending me a treaty with the King, which granted me all the rights asked for. Bastard. What a shocker. What a terrible thing to do. What was the outcome? Well, okay, they had to get cracking with this pretty quickly before it became too well known. But they didn't realise it was already on its way back to Moffat. In the meantime, they had got Ferreira, who was a bit of a dropper, picked him up from somewhere and said he was now going to be the manager of this new delegation of Lobengula's land. And Ferreira had a letter on him, which stated, and shortly issued tithes to 500 farms in Mashanaland. For the first 500 farms, I fixed the price at £5 for 3,000 Morgan and £2 per annum. For the next 500 pounds farms, the price will, of course, be raised. How funny that as Ferreira arrived in Maklutsi, he was arrested by the Bechuan Land Police, who knew him from way before. He was a criminal for many years back. And wasn't it extraordinary that just at that moment, Jermison 
was on his way up with the first batch of guns as promised in the Rudd concession. And coming down in panic was Thompson, whom Jameson then said, I don't know the king, you've got to come back to Matabili land with me. And who gave Jameson the letter? But of course, the Bechwana police. This is something you should read. Absolutely. Of course he should. So, it was nightmare stuff. Absolutely unbelievable what was going on. Um, this man, Lippert, demanded payment of £250,000 to Rhodes. Otherwise, he was going to put in full-page advertisements in all the major newspapers in South Africa, calling for those interested in the allocation of farms, township developments, etc., etc., and it would only be open to the Boers. Well, you can imagine what reaction that would have, too. So Rhodes effectively was told by the British government, pay this man out. Needless to say, it was not paid out at £250,000, but it would still have been a substantial amount. And what happened was, of course, that instead of the original Rudd concession, which was merely for gold, for ten people to go into, search for gold, build a house in order to be able to do so, it gave Rhodes settlement. Tragic. It's tragic. I think it's absolutely terrible, actually. Anyway, that's just my opinion. But in the meantime, poor old Chief Lochi, Lomangulo, his favourite in Duna, but he knew he'd given him the wrong advice, and he and all his family were murdered, which had been what caused the precipitate departure of Thompson as far as he possibly could to get out of the country and then having to go back again. So now, where were we? Right. Immediately, there was a hue and cry, and people told Lobengula that the Rudd concession copy that he had there, which Moffat had, was not the same as the original which Lobengula had signed. Helm said it was identical. And he came in for an enormous amount of unwarranted flack, really, because all he had done was translate exactly and try and find answers. But Maguire was the one who did not put it into the concession document itself. One was produced subsequently, but by then the heat was on and was out of order. So there we had this whole nightmare situation. And all the king wanted was to get the original document back from Cape Town so that he could compare the two. Eventually, it did get back. And he had the two. He had all his Indunas there. He had all the concessionaires who had caused problems and told him that the document, the copy he had from Moffat, was not the same as the one he'd signed. And his words were, what have you got to say? There is the paper. Their spokesman answered, Ah, oh, King, this document is all right, one of the concessioners. We were wrong in what we said. With a smile on his face, the King looked at them, and rubbing his hands across his mouth, he said, Thomason has rubbed fat on your mouths. All white men are liars, but Thomason, you have lied the least. Nightmare stuff going on. Anyway, in amongst all of this lot, of course, other people had wormed their way in to see Lobengula, who by this stage was infuriated, not wanting to talk to anybody, didn't know who to believe, and one of those was a man called Mound. Now, Mound came to him to see if he could bargain for a piece of land in what we know today as Mazoe, in that area. Now, it was in hot contentions because the Portuguese were threatening to come through into that area as well. And Lobengula said to them, no, I'm not going to do anything because until you take two envoys tomorrow to see the Queen, because some people say there is no White Queen, other people say there is, I want to talk to the White Queen myself. So a letter was drafted on his behalf and 
two envoys were waiting the next day to go to England. I did read a bit about that, and we'll do another um, podcast about that, because it's it's extraordinary what happened, and it's extraordinary what happened afterwards, and how everybody was so fascinated by what they'd done. But quite a fun little excerpt, which I didn't include last time. The envoys were taken to see the lions at the zoological gardens in London. This was having been to all sorts of military parades and having spoken to each other on a telephone in Cindebele, which nearly gobsmacked them because they couldn't understand how the phone mic could speak English, but how could it speak Cindebele? So they were taken to see the lions at the zoological gardens. Their excitement was intense. When they came to these animals, Baba Yan could scarcely be restrained from attacking one of the lords of his native forest with his umbrella, and he simply couldn't understand why he was prevented. That's a lovely story, and it's a lightening of the mood of what was happening at that particular time. In return, they took back a letter from Lord Knutsford, who was secretary for the colonies, with particular interest in South Africa. His letter said, A king gives a stranger an ox, not his whole herd of cattle. Otherwise, what would other strangers arriving have to eat? And next week, we'll show you another side to exactly what he went back to tell the king. So the toing and froing, it was not good. It was not good. There's no question about that. But the fact that that German was prepared to get Lobengula to sign two blank sheets of paper as... Uh, anyway, it happened. It was a sign of the times. It was the imperialism of colonialism. And we have to acknowledge that you had Germany, Belgium, France, Portugal, all of them wanting to get into that land in the middle of the rivers. If anything, they had been, they had led an idyllic life for far longer than any other part of Africa, in that they had been the least troubled by slavery or anything else until 1840, when Mzilikazi crossed Limpopo and suddenly everybody started to close in. Well, to end on a little bit from that particular chapter when I talk about the Rudd Concession, Prune was a great friend, and he was always talking at a million miles an hour. He was absolutely so excited by everything we did. It had been a thoroughly satisfactory conclusion to a very difficult evening of talking between the four friends. As they all went off to bed, Prune had another reason to be happy. He was writing Snuffbox in his notebook to remind him of Baba Yan and Machete and he'd added three new words to his memory bank. Nefarious, obfuscation, and scurrilous. Kind of summed up the whole day, really. As it did. Sad, but true. So, there we get to the Rudd Concession, which really was a critical turning point in the whole thing. From there on, we move little time of tranquillity until the war in 1893. But we will talk about the Pioneer Column first, just to give you an idea of the size of what happened, how long it took, what the numbers were, and how they managed what was really quite an extraordinary and epic journey. And I have to say, had some courageous and excellent people in its midst. Quite a lot of people have said they'd love to have a debate. I'd love to have a debate too, because I'm picking up so many bits of lovely information that I can use within the fictional or actuality of the next book, which I shall be writing within the next six months. If you'd be interested in joining me for a Zoom next week, perhaps, then go to my website, www.jillbakerauthor.com Com, and you will find a way to just click through and it'll come through to me as an email. If you're interested, I'll send you the Zoom information 
let's get together and talk about what will by then have been 13 weeks of programmes. So I look forward to seeing you. If that comes off, that will be on the 10, 11, 12, the 19th, Friday the 19th of June, that we will try and put together some sort of Zoom at a time that will suit as many people as we possibly can. Always difficult when you're going around the world. Thank you for joining me. It's been a tough one trying to remember all the bits and pieces, but I hope you've been able to follow it and look forward to seeing you next week. <laughs>